since I left that team, they are now down in the tenth division, actually. Tenth? Yeah, we were. <laughs> we were I didn't even know it went down that far. Yeah, Me we neither. They went completely bankrupt, and then now they got relegated all the way to the tenth division. <laughs> like a, that's like it looks like pub league, you know. What's up, everybody? Welcome on in to the call up, Susanna Collins, along with my gal, but partner in crime, the lovely Jillian Sakovitz. Look at your lovely setting back there. It's thanks. Just, if you guys, if you're if you're if you're listening, um, Jillian has has moved, and she is in a beautiful new home, and it looks it looks stunning. It suits you. What can I say? A Trader Joe's orchid goes a long way, sis. It sure does. It sure does. I need more foliage in my uh, little studio. We'll get. We'll get you there. We'll get there. Uh, how you How you doing? How's life? Oh, I'm good. I'm feeling very um, fall fresh. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm excited. It It feels like the playoff push is really on. It's and here. I gotta say, you know, we are constantly digging. We are investigators. Mm-hmm. But this interview with Goalkeeper Tyler Miller, guys, I think we got like five untold stories that made him just infinitely more interesting to me. Already one of the nicest guys in the league, but we uncovered some (laughs) serious fire. Oh, it's great. It's it's a really, really fun interview. How are you? Uh, I'm great. I I wanted to show off because you have to. If you guys Mm -hmm. are are listening, um, I am wearing my I Voted Early sticker which yeah is you did important. i went to my polling place in brooklyn yesterday morning i got it done there's early voting in new york for the first time ever and i will tell you it was seamless jill i walked right in walked out i was done within 10 minutes and i feel so good it just it was a, a great way to kind of kick off the week so i just want to well thank you encouraging everybody to uh to get out and vote and let your voices be heard Sue's credit to you a week out rainy day yeah and i just want to say on behalf of myself and the united states of america i <laughs> thank you for doing your civic duty and getting out there and voting i sent my mail-in ballot yay uh, a, few, a few weeks back so good work good work we are two for two on the call up here for here for here voting. For voting. What else are we here for, Jill? You what tell me. Got? I okay. saw yeah, you came good. up with these this week, and all I saw was GoPro plus Peter Vermees. This Don't even need to know thing. more. All I know is I am here for that. This is amazing. So um, somehow, Sporting Kansas City convinced Peter Vermees to put on a GoPro. This was ahead of, of one of their matches. I can't remember which one it was, but he basically had a GoPro strapped to his chest and was walking around pregame. And like yelling at at coaches at players like guys guys come on we need a good performance we need a good performance he went up to Gianluca Busio this is so fantastic and he was like he's like boost boost we need some bangers do it for the gram Peter Vermees these words came out of his mouth do it for the gram and I was like who knew that Peter Vermees was so woke it was great and I two am questions so here for it two questions come to mind yes does Peter Vermees know what the gram is or has he just heard people say it as a way to amp people up and he I says it? Know. I don't know. I want to believe that Peter Vermees like is, he, it would be a shock to know that he is, he's up on, on Instagram. But he's got perhaps- kids. He's got, he's got two teenage kids. When we had him on, he talked to us about That's that. True. And was he totally aware of the GoPro's capabilities? Like as someone once told me, nothing happens in Kansas City uh, without Peter Vermees knowing about it. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think he think he may be a little more technologically savvy than he lets on. It is really great. Uh, SKC tweeted it out. So go go back and look at their Twitter feed and watch it if you haven't, because it's it's very very funny. Can they keep it on him when he goes home? Oh, that's Please. what we need. That is what new we reality need. show for the MLS channel that. Uh, doesn't exist. I don't know. Maybe for we're E, full, we're full of good ideas. So <laughs> something that I know that we're both here for, but we can kind of get into a, a deeper conversation about this is Halloween candy, because oh my tis, god, you're tis so the evil. Season. Tis the season, Jill, and every time I go into a CVS, yes, she's got a pumpkin. I just see the the candy aisle and I my I start salivating and it takes everything I have. It's adorable. It takes everything that I have not to um, just go crazy and buy all the candy. But 
what are some, there have been a lot of uh, candy brackets. So people kind of like ranking the Halloween candy. That is so I, ridiculous. I want to know what are, what are some of your favorites? And then what are the ones when you would get them? Like someone would throw it in your bag. You'd be like, oh, really? Like, yeah. You know? Um, good question. I don't feel, I don't think I liked Sour Patch Kids, but I'll tell you this now as an adult, I don't have a lot of memories as a kid of like having any about being against anything really. Wow. Um, oh, but I can tell you as an adult, mm -hmm. I love the optics of candy corn, but it makes me vom.com. Like I don't love, yep. Sorry, Sears. I'm a Reese's gal. I'm a I'm a I'm a Reese's peanut butter cup kind of uh, gal. A little salty, I, as we know. I mean, I do love sweet. me some Reese's. So I you know, kind of like me. Candy corn is <laughs> that's great. You are you are the Reese's peanut butter cup of uh, of MLS, my darling. Um, candy corn is a very polarizing food. People love it or they hate it. I fall on the love it side. I can't stop eating it once. Can I we start, start a drinking game for how many times I hear polarizing in a day on so many levels? Every oh, time here. Polarizing. It's a good word. But yeah, I, I am team candy corn. So, but when I was a kid and we would go trick or treating, it was, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have like vivid memories of like dumping out my bag and like sorting it, you know, like mm -hmm. I would sort the candy. I was a huge, huge fan of Reese's. I loved uh, Twix. I loved Butterfinger. There was always the house, Jill, that gave out raisins, a box of raisins. And it was like, ah, uh, no, like straight into the trash. And then there was the house. Uh, my, no. my, there was the, there was the, a house down the street. It was an old lady and she used to give out pennies. She would just like take a handful of pennies and put it in your trick or treat bag. And we were like, Why does that sound? Maybe it's my pandemic what? self. That sounds dirty. Yeah. Oh, my, uh, yeah. It was not. I remember my parents being like, We should report her. And I was like, She's old. She, you know, just. You also can swallow them. I'm, it's a choking exactly. hazard. And, but then, Jill, there was always the house that would give out the full size candy bars. I didn't have one of those. And we would strategic, we would always start there. Because you wanted to get there early in case they ran out. So that was where we would start our whole trick-or-treating route. And then we would, you know, go from there. But, yeah, these are my – I clearly very passionate about um, – Clearly. Clearly it was a – it was really big in your ask, um, childhood. Ask, and no, I find it no adorable. Uh, a little tease coming up. Suzanne and I will spare you of our costumes. But Tyler Miller – I guarantee you, you will not hear a funnier, better costume that his mom dressed him up in. And he didn't seem to hate it. That's all I'm going to say. So I will leave you people with that. All right, time now for our AT&T 5G call to the field. And for that, we are so excited to bring in a guy that we miss desperately seeing out on the field, goalkeeper for Minnesota United and uh, the mustached maestro. <laughs> uh Tyler Miller, Tyler, so good to see you, buddy. How you doing? I'm doing well. As you can tell, the my the mustache has has gone away. That was my that was going to be one of our first questions. We were going to check right. on the status of the facial hair. What's uh, you you were letting it go? You had the long hair, and now you're you're very clean cut and clean shaven. What happened? You know, the long hair was fun for a little while, but then there was a day where it was like 95 degrees here and I was mm. absolutely dying. And the last thing I felt like dealing with was my hair being in my face. So I don't know how you guys do it when you're working out, but oh. for me, it was, it had to go. And then down in Orlando, my buddy, Aaron Schoenfeld, he, he had a mustache going and I was like, whatever, like, let's, let's grow out our mustaches for as long as we're playing. So once we got knocked out, that was when it had to go. It's just, it's time. It's time. It ran its course. You look great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you okay. mentioned the but MLS, the MLS is back tournament. Um, Tyler, I know you had to play through your hip injury in Orlando. So you underwent hip surgery in August. Um, but we saw on Instagram that you put the boots and the gloves back on for the first time last week. Congratulations. Two and a half months later, how are you feeling? I feel great. To be honest, I feel better than I did before the surgery. Um, this has been an issue that I've been dealing with, honestly, for the last five years. I didn't know what it was, but then when I came to Minnesota, I got uh, MRI and they found uh, two hip impingements. Um, and my goal was to kind of play as long as I could without 
getting this surgery, but it kind of started to break down when we were down in Orlando. Mm -hmm. uh, some more nagging injuries came, and with how the season was going, the unpredictability-ness of what was going to be taking place this fall, I just felt like this was the best time to get it done and then come back in 2021 and be healthy as ever. We debated even asking you. <laughs> Susan and I were talking yeah, about this are. before we popped on of, is that appropriate? And I'm like, you know what? Yeah. We're all we're all feeling it of, of life decisions this year. And well, yeah. if I'm going to do it, 2020, man. Was that a fraction of a factor of like, you know what? If I'm going to have to miss the season and I'm going to have to go under the knife and get surgery, this is the year to, to do it. Yeah, I just felt like the games and what it costs for the players these days to play in these games, traveling mm -hmm. away on the day of the game, yeah, uh, the grueling schedule, the testing, playing every Sunday, Wednesday, uh, it just felt like it would have almost been nearly impossible for my body to hold up throughout the entire season that True. another injury probably would have happened. And so I just felt like the best thing for my career and my future longevity of being able to play was to have this surgery done, be done with it, and then I can come back and not have to worry about my hips or anything that comes with the hips uh, moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you never want to get injured, right? Like injuries are, are horrible any, any time, but I think, you know, the decision to kind of focus on 2021 was definitely the right one for you. Um, it's such, this has just been such an odd, an odd season, an odd year in general. What, what's it been like kind of just being on the sidelines, watching your teammates play week after week? Like it's a completely new perspective for you. What, what has that been like? Uh, it's been tough uh, to be honest, like sitting on my couch and watching the games and, and not even being able to go to the stadium because sitting in a stadium chair for that long causes me too much discomfort. So uh, it's been a, a very lonely time, to be mm -hmm. honest, with you, uh, when it comes to, to watching those games. But when I get to go into the facility and see those guys and interact with them, that's kind of when I'm the happiest because just being around them, acting like I'm part of the team, even though, yes, I'm part of the team, but there still feels like there's this little bit that's like missing and that's obviously the playing part. And so when in between my two surgeries I had, I was able to go to the field and, and watch them play. And just that feeling of seeing guys warming up and being uh, ready to, to start the game and, and all of the little nuances about playing that you don't realize you miss until you can't do it. That's when I was like, Oh man, I still like really love this game and I'm excited to like and motivated to get back and out on that field. Tyler, let's take a step back. Uh, you grew up in New Jersey, but to be clear, actually just outside of Philadelphia in New Jersey, uh, before you attended college at Northwestern, started your pro career drafted by Seattle in 2015. Um, it feels like we see a lot of sports talent and MLS talent come out of New Jersey. Yeah. Why? <laughs> As a New Yorker, I got to know, why do why? they come from New Jersey? I mean, we're just bred differently there. I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> it's, maybe it's that pork roll that we grew up on. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a very diverse, interesting place to grow up because you have a lot of a lot of different types of families there. And so you're kind of exposed to a lot of different heritages, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different sports mm -hmm. with that. And so I grew up trying to play every single sport I possibly could. I played baseball, basketball, ultimate Frisbee, all of these random sports. Um, but then it, finally, like I, I stuck with soccer and, and that was kind of the one that stuck. So I really have no explanation to, to why New Jersey is a hot, hot, uh, hot bed, hot for, bed, hot bed for athletes and, and professional professional athletes at, at that. But uh, I'm I'm proud to be be from there, even though I don't don't always say that I am from there. I, a lot of times I will claim I'm from Philly more than Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm 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 so in, I can't believe that uh, ultimate frisbee was the thing. I just had an I was like once what once this like pandemic is over, I you want to like, throw a frisbee? We gotta, yeah, we've got uh, this is going to be a feature ultimate frisbee with Tyler yeah. Miller. Like um, sign sign me true up. true story. 
my friend group in college, I ended up, you know, in college, you like get these big old houses and you live with them in them with all your friends. The house across the street from me was the ultimate Frisbee house. Yes. And that was my friend group. And then my sister ended up marrying one of the people from the there ultimate you go. Frisbee house. So it's a wow. beautiful thing, bringing people together. Let's go to the broadcast booth. Um, Tyler, we saw you. I was going on, uh, flipping through Instagram and I saw you standing there with the microphone in your hand. Um, so that was kind of a cool way to, uh, get into your, I don't know, to find something to do during your rehab. How did that come about? Whose idea was it? Was it harder than it looked, than you thought it was? Like, I want to know what it was like for the role reversal. So I got a communications degree from Northwestern and I figured I might as well try to put it to use. Oh, okay. Um, and I reached out to the, to the production team and was like, can I, can I give this a go and see what it's like? And, uh, I didn't have anything else. So I figured this was a good way for me to stay involved with the team and, and kind of be around. Um, and I honestly got this huge adrenaline rush from it because the game went by so fast and I'm trying to find like these little moments where I'm like, okay, I have a good point. I can make it here. And then, and then I'm done talking. And it's like those eight to nine little points I get to make were just so full of adrenaline that I was like so amped up after I was like so excited. So I don't know what my future will hold in terms of playing, how long and what will be next, whether I go into broadcasting or not, but it's definitely something that I'm glad I got the opportunity to at least try. The game hype is real. Yeah. You know, as someone, you know, I didn't play obviously at a professional level, but that like mental exhaustion that you yeah. have the come down after the game, I mean, as a broadcaster, like I'll be so tired as soon as the game ends, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to go to sleep. But then I don't go to bed till three or four in the morning. So I'm going on for everything about the game. I'm going over the halftime show. I'm going over post game. Did we say this yeah. right? Did we get, I don't know. There's something about it. The adrenaline up, but yeah. then the crash is all very real. There's so much more that goes into it too, that people yeah. don't really think you just show up and then you just call the game. They don't realize all the research that you have to do Thank going you. into the game. They don't realize like, <laughs> You actually have to watch game film yourself and realize like, okay, what did I do well this game? What did I not do well? How can I get improve? It's it's almost like you're playing a professional sport. So I have a, I have a huge appreciation for you guys, the jobs that you do, as well as all the other broadcasters out there. Yes, thank you, thank you, Tyler. We work very very hard, and while Good we, answer. while we while we might make it look very easy, it is. <laughs> It is not. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, no, but it is. It's a. It's a. It's. It's exercising a, a different muscle. You know, you got to kind of like, yeah. as you know the game so well, it is ingrained in your body. But then being able to channel that and to talk about it in a easy. way that an audience is going to understand, is not. It's not easy. And I think um, you know, there's a misconception sometimes that that guys can just kind of like go straight to the booth and, and it's a skill. And it's a, like I said, it's a different muscle that you've got to, that you've got to exercise, but you, you're fantastic. I, if you're thinking of, you know, hopefully way down the line, but post <laughs> post career uh, playing career, I think broadcast yeah. is uh, in, the, your, the one, in your, in your one piece of advice that, uh, that I got before from Cal Williams, our, one of our, uh, Oh, he's great. Guys, oh, yeah. He told me just be concise and precise. Mm -hmm. And, the two best things that you can do you don't want to get caught rambling about a point uh when it's, it's long gone and then he, another thing he was like if there's a turnover and they're going to goal you just drop the f out and let me you stop over. talking <laughs> yeah yeah yep it's so true but there's like little nuances like that that you don't realize and then until you until you do it but it's fun you're doing a great job um let's talk about um usa Cause you got, you got called into camp last year. What do you, do you have, is this a big aspiration for you, Tyler? When you look at like career goals is, is, is being a, a member of the U S men's national team. Is that, is that up there for you? Absolutely. It's yeah. always been the thing I've dreamt about when I was younger and um, being able to listen to that national anthem before the game actually kicks off, I think is would, would be one of the proudest moments of my career. Um, and mainly because of how much my parents have sacrificed to allow me to, to do this. Like it would be something that, yes, I would do it for myself, but also do it for my parents and my family because they've 
supported me through all of the ups and downs, all the trials and tribulations of everywhere that I've went, going to Germany where I was on a bankrupt team and then not knowing where to go next and then Seattle and all, all of these little steps along the way, they've kind of supported me the entire time. And so being able to put on that Jersey and be a part of gold cup, uh, last summer was, was a huge honor for me. And, um, with how my season had finished at LAFC, yeah, I fell out of favor there, but <clears throat> I know that coming back now, the best thing that I can do is get healthy from this injury, obviously first and foremost, but then go in week in week out and just put in consistent solid performances. And if I do that, then hopefully that opportunity opens back up again, but that's something that I'll just can you tell us a little bit about that German team? You know, when you take a look at your timeline, it says your senior career, you went from yeah. team in Ocean City, New Jersey, Chicago Fire U23, to, you need to pronounce this for me. Uh, Zweibrücken. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what was that progression like? And how did you end up going from, you know, these domestic teams to... I'm going to go play in Germany. How did that come about? And what did you take away from it? It sounds kind of scary. No, I, I don't know why my Wikipedia page says that Ocean City and Chicago Fire PDL are senior teams because they're just like teams you play on in the summer leagues, like in college. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Zweibrücken was my first professional experience. And I am so naive going to this small little village in the southeast corner of Germany. Uh, there's like 2,000 people that are in this village and <clears throat> I don't have a car. I don't speak German. I'm just getting out of college, so I have no money. Um, and Sounds like a Euro trip, but only you're there to play soccer. Like, like, hmm, I had a similar experience not playing soccer professionally, yeah. but hi. I was like, this is going to be such a cool experience. I'll get to actually like travel on weekends and experience the lifestyle of Germany. And then you realize I don't have a car. Like I don't have money to be able to afford a train. Like, I don't know how I'm going to get groceries from the store that's three kilometers away and carry them all back. Like, right. I was sharing a room with one of my college teammates, actually, for the entirety of the six months. We didn't have a laundry machine in our place. So we had to, like, take our clothes to the facility, have the kids <laughs> and then get them back. Like, the what I went through for those six months was shocking. And to... to, to um, I, I don't know what word I'm thinking of, but, but character really, building, character building, Tyler. Yeah, it was it was a huge, <laughs> it was a huge character building moment for me. And through those six months of my first experience of what professional soccer is like, I give up 51 goals in 13 games, and I get two red cards. <laughs> Sick! That's exciting. <laughs> Badass, Tyler Miller. <laughs> that is amazing. Wow. How does that even happen? Well, the one of them was just a handball outside the box. That okay. Are these so, German standards for red cards? Because, like, come on. Yeah. The That's sweet. Hit my shoulder. And then the other one, the ref, I got cleated in my knee. The ref was speaking German to me. And I was, like, continually saying, I don't speak German. And then eventually I got so frustrated and I dropped the curse word. And then yeah, he was like, well, that. Stand that one. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. There you go. So you got a red card for cursing in English? Maybe what is it that they wanted you to curse in German? Like what is that? I don't know. I think that's so weak. Yeah, because guys, <sighs> I mean, guys curse in soccer, and so have I've heard Brad Guzan um, for the first time. So like, obviously, I'm down on the sideline, but even then, even being that close to Brad, I usually can't hear him the whole game, but obviously having no fans in Mercedes Benz with the roof closed, it echoes. Mm -hmm. So I've heard Brad way more and every guy is an effer. Get that, that effer is left footed. Get that effer. Get the, and I'm like, Brad has used the F word probably 690 times this half. Yeah. <laughs> no one cares. Yeah. And yeah. It's, 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 it's weird how like, if I would have literally cursed in German, probably would have been fine. Yeah. I could said something in English, it was like, oh, yeah, we're going to give you a red card for this one. I feel like there was a little bias there, Tyler. I don't know. That's uh, doesn't doesn't seem right. Um, That's so interesting. It's really fascinating. It's a great but story. Since I left that team, they are now down in the 10th division, actually. 10th? Yeah. We were, <laughs> we were I didn't even team. know it went down that far. Yeah, we Me neither. 
they went completely bankrupt, and then now they got relegated all the way to the tenth division. You've had a, a very fascinating journey, and you in 2015 you were drafted by the Seattle Sounders and got to spend um, some time under the the tutelage of of Stephen Fry, one of the uh, you know MLS MLS legends, um, one of our producers at MLSsoccer.com. Anders is a, a huge, huge Sounders fan. So he wanted us to ask you, um, during that time that you spent uh, with Seattle, did what, what were some of the, the things that you learned or picked up from, from Steph? Was, it, was there any, anything that, that he kind of enlightened you on? I think the biggest thing that I learned from Steph throughout my two and a half years that I spent there working with him and Tommy Dutra as well, um, was just like, you really have to have this special bond in the goalkeeper group. There's only going to be one goalkeeper that's ever going to play. And you want to, yes, compete with that guy, but also playing, you want to show support. You want to support this person through it because the role could be reversed and you could be playing. And then if he's not supporting you, then you kind of create this hostile environment. That's not really good to work in. And every day you have to show up and work with these people. And so, Steph was great about taking me under his wing and whenever I had questions, he would talk to me and, and we would watch games like together, watch the, his clips of when he played and we would watch clips together of when I played for S2. Um, and so he was really good at just kind of taking me under my, uh, under his wing and really supporting me. And, and the funny thing is the first game back there with LAFC, we played Seattle first game. And we won 1-0, and, and during the game, the fans were, were chanting, uh, Stephen Fry taught you everything you know. And, like, I turned around. You're like, yeah, me. true. I was like, okay, like, yeah, that's a good one. Like, <laughs> Not a diss. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I always – it's always interesting because when you're a kid, t- you know, playing town soccer, whatever it is, everyone wants to be the attacker. So I'm yeah. all – and I got thrown in goal, and I was allowed because – no one would play it. And I was allowed to play striker if I played goalie for a half. So I'd have to be a goalie for a half, but then I was like itching, like, okay, can I go up? So I'm always interested to know what made you become a goalkeeper and whose game kind of did you grow up watching that you model yours after? I mean, I became a goalkeeper simply because I was tired of sitting on the bench. Like I tried. (laughs) I tried. That's the best answer we've had yeah that's amazing yeah i tried to play on the field and and they were <laughs> i was sitting on the bench for the entire first half and they were like all right like our goalie's coming out who wants to go in and i tried it and then i got to punt the ball once and i thought it was just the coolest thing ever and then kind of gradually got got into it more and more um and yeah it, it just kind of grew on me and then i trained at it and turned out i was pretty good at it and so I was like, all right, I'll stick with this and see where this this goes. Um, it's great. But, Make yourself yeah. useful. Yeah, no, I watched I watched a lot of the the classic goalkeepers like Van der Sar, Buffon, uh, Joe Hart, um, Iker Casillas, like all these guys. Neuer. Yeah. Uh, I kind of really didn't have a team. I claimed Liverpool, but like I didn't have a team. I just kind of like watched soccer to just see what the goalkeepers were doing and and see how they were playing. That's so cool. Uh, and now you're kind of in a, in a interesting position, obviously, like after your, your surgery, uh, Dane St. Clair comes in young, young keeper, um, who's doing really well for, for the team. What have you, have you kind of taken him under your wing a little bit? What sort of advice have, have you given him in that role? I mean, I talked to Dane before his first game and I told him like, just go out there and have fun. Don't worry about making a mistake because if you worry about making a mistake Mm -hmm. more times than not you're gonna make a mistake and so literally like you have no idea what's gonna happen just go out there relax have fun and at the end of the day that's that's what we're doing here yes we get paid to play and it's a privilege and, and it's an honor obviously to to play week in week out but you don't know how long your career is going to last. You don't know what's going to happen. And so why not go out there and, and try to shoot to be the best and, and try to shoot that? Why, why worry about like, oh, what about all the bad things that could happen potentially? Why not focus on all of the great things that could happen on the other way? 
So that's kind of been my mindset lately too, is like, like, yeah, I could sit here and focus about like all of these little things that I really have no control over Mm -hmm. and cause myself so much more stress. Why not just like think about like, okay, I have the ability to go and do all of these great things. Why not just go and shoot for them and then see what happens? That's great advice. Advice we could all use. I'm sure it's especially helpful for a 23 year old. 100%. Um, goalkeeper. But I mean, to echo what you're saying, whether you're 23 or you're 73, we all need to hear that this year. Everyone's got a ton of stuff um, going on. Let's talk a little bit about your uh, manager, (laughs) a large, maybe the biggest fan out there of MLSsoccer.com and the content (laughs) that it produces. Adrian, if you're listening, we're not like them. We love you, Adrian. We are different. (laughs) Um, what is Adrian like as a manager? Is there kind of like any funny stories you, you can tell us about him? Because he has definitely become one of the bigger characters in the mm-hmm. league. A quiet character in his own way. When he's got something to say, it's it's very cheeky and it's very funny, as the Brits can be. I think I think that he he shows his inner player in him a lot of the times too, because mm-hmm. obviously he mm-hmm. had a very successful career in England. And so you see that come out a lot of times in his interviews or how he is, but I've never seen somebody more competitive in the net tennis game that we play the day before a game. He, him and Sean, our assistant coach are out there practicing before we even start this game. And then they're up there arguing about calls and all of these things, trying to, trying to, to get to the final. And more times than not, they actually do end up getting pretty far in this game. So it's pretty impressive to see them move around and just like the tactics, but they love the little short jabs banter. And, and so it's, it's a fun environment to be in. It's very relaxed, um, easy to go out there and, and play for a player's coach um, who you know is going to back you up no matter what happens. I, I I have a question too about the the whole during the the MLS's back tournament. It was so great. We we ran with this storyline so hard, but it was like the the kind of us against them mentality that Adrian he was like, right. hey, you oh, guys could go twenty and zero, and he'd be like, we're the underdogs. The media <laughs> hates us. The media hates us. You guys hate us, and so and we were yeah. like, we love. Like I was like, I love Minnesota. We don't hate America. you. But we don't I, think you're bad. We think you're I, really good. I want to know, how did that play out in the locker room? Were you guys kind of like, yeah, like the media does hate us. Like what was what was the, the reaction in the locker room when that kind of became one of the storylines of the tournament? Our guys really rallied behind that, to be honest with you. Yeah. We went into that game against Columbus. I think so many people had written us off. And I think that's the game more so that, that a lot of guys uh, – like hold to for for the whole underdog story because Columbus was undefeated or or close to it and and playing Mm -hmm. well. And so they kind of expected us to go Mm -hmm. in there kind of not really perform that well, but we were undefeated as well going into that game too. Yeah. Yeah, you were. I think that 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 kind of gets lost in in the story. Like, yeah, we had two ties in the MLS's back tournament, but like we were still a really good team and we still are, but in that moment, I think guys were really rallying behind that of like, okay, like they don't expect anything of us. So like, we're the only ones that have to believe in us. And that's really how it should be at, in general. Like the guys in that locker room are really the only ones that have to believe in that team itself. So if you have that, you have the ability to be a very special team. I love it. I, for the record, I have, I have been a Minnesota Stan for like the last three seasons. I've always put you guys in the playoffs. I've always said that you were a top contender in the West. And you can go back through the files. Adrian Heath, I'm looking at you. I was going to say, Susie's not listening. No. <laughs> never know. No, I'm just never kidding. Know. You never no. know. If, if he's going to listen, it might be this one. I have to say, I think the Loon is the best um, oh. logo in MLS. It's it a, it's cool. a it's a beaut. Okay. We talk about being a special team. The most special team in the regular season gets this uh, little old disc called the Supporter Shield. And it was taken away from us, but then it was given back to us. Yeah. What's your thoughts on the Supporter Shield? And what are your thoughts on if you have success in 2020? Like, should there be an asterisk? Or is it like, no, there's an exclamation point. This year was really freaking hard. <laughs> The supporter shield is is a very tricky one because 
there is a balance throughout the MLS season, but you don't play everybody in a normal MLS season to begin with. Like, okay. especially as we're adding more teams, it's already semi imbalanced because depending on your conference, depending on your geographical location, you're playing more games against maybe harder opponents, maybe weaker opponents. And this year you've got teams in Canada who are playing more te- games against team, other teams in Canada. And then you have yeah. other teams in, in the Northeast that are playing an uh, abundance of games there. So do I think it should be awarded? I think you could be honest. I mean, yeah, like I I think it should be awarded like because the amount of sacrifices that teams are having to go through this year. um, But will everybody look back and be like, oh, this team won the Supporter Shield? A lot of times people don't remember who wins the Supporter Shield to begin Mm -hmm. with. Like, Really? That's true. You hit the nail on the head there. I remember when Atlanta United in 2018 uh, threw the supporter shield out the window when they decided to lose 4-1 to TFC, who was all was eliminated from the playoffs, yeah. and everyone was crushed. Yeah. And Dan Gargan, who won an MLS Cup in 2014 with the Galaxy, said, guys, if they go on to win MLS Cup, no one remembers who won the supporter shield. Yeah. That's exactly what they did. And who won, yeah. the, who won the supporter shield in 2018? Red Bulls. Oh, did you? Suze. I wouldn't have known, to be honest with you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I what do you get? Like, I won the Supporter Shield last year, record se- record uh, breaking season with LA. Yeah. But then all of the narratives are about Seattle and their ability to go to three out of the four last MLS Cups. It's so, so true. Yeah, like, the it's a good point. is relevant and important, but at the end of the day, people only really care about the MLS Cup. Let's um let's get a little bit more lighthearted for for a second before we let you go. It is uh it is it is the the Halloween season. Um we earlier in the pandemic, you did one of my oh, favorite yes. things that I saw ever um during this stretch was the the yeah. Rambo, the Rambo remake, yeah. um which was exceptional. I like I feel like you actually put in a lot of time and effort into that. It was so so good. So I feel like you're a guy like based on your your costumes alone you're a guy that that maybe embraces Halloween a little bit. Obviously, it's going to be a little different this year. But um, <laughs> are you? Do you have like a, a favorite costume from childhood or from from recently? Like, tell us tell us your are thoughts you, on on. Halloween. Are you putting something on and then sitting on your couch? Yeah, <laughs> I probably won't be dressing up. Uh, <laughs> as much fun as it is being dressed up and sitting on the couch, it's not the same when you're alone by yourself. But sure. uh, and an adult, yeah. <laughs> Are we ever really adults? Uh, yeah. um, when I was in sixth grade, my mom made me this cotton candy costume. Oh, cute. So uh, my dad is a third degree black belt in Aikido. And so he had these white pants. And so <laughs> I put on these white pants and then my mom had a winter coat and she uh, hot, uh, glued um, like these cotton balls or something to it, whatever this, this material, all around it, and then spray painted it pink. <laughs> and, and then I had a pink, a pink like hat on as well, and my face was pink. So I was a stick of cotton candy. For, I like, would kill for photo poster. evidence. Of- Can you get us a picture by the time it's, we release this in a couple it hours? Is unbelievable. Oh, no. <laughs> we have a photo. You have to send it to us. Your mom, you're contractually obligated. Your, your mother has kept a photo somewhere. There's no Go, way. Go, Mrs. Miller. We love that. That's the best costume. Honestly, that's what I want to be. I think yeah. it's brilliant. Really, all this dress is cotton candy? Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Very creative. Um, <laughs> and, and to Susanna's point, um, after Halloween comes every four years, photo. Um, the election this year is more important than ever. So Tyler Miller, we usually close out the show with some type of message, but you know what? Why don't you leave the fans uh, with your own personal thoughts on uh, voting? Well, I think voting is one of the biggest honors that we have in this country. Um, And I think that it is an opportunity for many people to have their voice heard. And so I think passing up on that is a, a sad excuse 
for 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 not showing your support for this country and for everything that we've gone through especially this year i think it's the most important time to get out to share your voice show your opinion because you have the opportunity to you know that you said it so well that you can go and you have a week to do it november 3rd you know you early voting Susanna collins is proudly repping her sticker um you know i sent in a mail-in ballot they got to we got to put like the stickers in the mail in ballots, I think, because the stickers have become such a point of pride that like I wish I could have mine on my forehead. But like Tyler Miller said, it's been a difficult year. Get out and vote. It's your right. Yep. And if you don't if you don't use it, you lose it. Yep. No, <laughs> as they say, no, <laughs> no, Tyler Miller, goalkeeper extraordinaire, cotton candy man, <laughs> um, Mustache Maestro, thank you so much for joining us. We are so appreciative of you, and we love this little catch-up. Yeah, and we can't learn a lot. Can't wait to see you back on the field, Tyler.